And now I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on managing and influencing your stakeholders. Don't let them manage you. I'm going to hand things over to our future presenter today. He is executive director at ITML Institute and has over 30 years experience in the industry as a technical professional, IT executive, CIO, and trainer, Mr. Eric Bloom. Eric, you now have the floor. Great, thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, thank you so much, Mir uh, Mayan. I uh, thank you so much for uh, setting this up to New Horizons for allowing me to do so and sponsoring this, and uh, also to Kelly and Kara, who I know are on the line. So uh, welcome all. Uh, as you see my, uh, by my bio here is that I won't go through my, uh, my credentials, but I'll just say that uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, if there are any project managers on the line, uh, certainly uh, influencing your stakeholders and others is something that will be very important to you all. Uh, I'd also like to say is that at the top it says, you know, I have 25 or 30 years of experience. Uh, doesn't mean I'm old. I started this when I was very, very young. Anyway, just kidding. But now from here, well, let's move to what I would say will be about uh, 58 minutes of material. I'd like to begin today's webinar by asking you a question. Um, and that is, is that as it says here, um, how much of your work day do you spend influencing your stakeholders and others? They could be members of your team. Uh, it could be people who are dotted line resources to you, et cetera. So uh, on, on the left, list the activity. And I don't mean today or tomorrow. I mean, generally speaking, on average. Like, and what I mean by influencing them is, wouldn't it be great? Think of this world, of, this nirvana of world, where uh, you would say to people, say the people, the people that are dotted line to you or your stakeholders or whatnot, hey, everyone, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And then without you having to contact, contact them again or uh, ask them to, uh, to move forward on it or get status of where they've done on it or basically, you know, huck them continually to make it happen, they just all did it. Well, everything after that initial request where you're saying a reminder that all this is due on Friday, hey, Joe, uh, just checking to see where you stand on that deliverable for me. All of those things, all of those additional touches are influence. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and allow you to sort of fill this in on your own, obviously on your own paper, not on the screen itself, but your activities and the percentage of your day that you're influencing others related to those activities. If I could sing, I would do the Jeopardy theme song here, but uh, trust me, you would much rather have me talking than singing. And I'll give you another moment. Just another sec. Now, what I would strongly suggest that everyone does is save this list that you've put together until after the webinar. You know, when I say, all right, let's do brainstorming and let's do it right now, right this second, it's very, very hard to answer this as completely as you may. So let me say your first homework assignment, so to speak, from today's webinar is, you know, at a quiet moment, a moment of uh, reflection and so on. Sit back and finish this, this, uh, this activity out on your own. The reason is, is that the numbers that you come up with here, and I'll give you some examples. I've used this many, many, many times. Uh, but the better, the more you learn about influence in general, the return on investment is the time that you get back in your day from not having to influence people as much. Now, I'm going to give you a specific example of this. Generally speaking, when I, when I ask groups in person, when I get their feedback on is that it's between 15 and 75 percent of, of people's days or on specific activities are based on trying to influence them to do something. It could be presentations to talk them into it. It be, could be continually trying to roll, roll things out. It could be trying to get buy-in, et cetera. And now with that, in that wide variety of the 15 to 75 percent, at the lower end, the 15 percent, that tends to be people who are more in sort of production heads down roles.
you know, a programmer who's given a task and then just programs on that task and returns it. Uh, a tester who's given test cases, completes those test cases and returns them back. Uh, people who are running nightly production who are basically monitoring things and then when issues come up, what they do is they take it and hand off. In those, they roughly come up with about 15% of their day on average related to influence. But now let's talk about IT managers project managers, uh, people in client service, online tech support related to products, help desk even in some cases. They're as high as 75%. Product advocates fall under this. Also product managers. For those of you who are moving from a project manager to a product manager role where instead of being in charge of the project, you're in, in charge of the full life cycle of the piece of software or whatnot you're working on, is high as 75%. But let's cut it in the middle. Let's just make the math easy. So let's say that you do all this and say, oh, 25% of your day, or let me say 25% uh, of your day can be reduced by learning influence in general, long, long, you know, beyond what I'm, what I'm going to be showing you within the next hour. So if you can get 25% of your day back just by having to, by using better influence techniques, then you're getting two hours a day back based on an eight hour day. What could you do with two extra hours per day? Now, the reason that I'm starting out with this is I'm not trying to sell you on anything other than the importance of you learning influence, again, well beyond this today's topic, is because it's a major productivity piece for you. Um, also, and you'll see this again in the slide that we talk at the end, you know, why do we want to learn about a soft skill, which basically influence is? is because of the productivity that it provides you. So from here, now let's move into the content at hand. Now that I'm hoping that I got you all excited and all motivated to learn more about influence. I'd like to begin with this quote. It's one of, one of my two favorites actually related to this. Generally speaking, people are not against you they are for themselves. So what does that really mean? Have you ever worked with a stakeholder who you have to basically get on their schedule to meet with them and they always seem too busy? Oh, gee, you know, next couple of weeks, forget it. And then you call them in two weeks and they say, oh, you know, I, I just can't do it. You know, uh, uh, maybe catch up with me next month. And meanwhile, you're looking at the calendar as your project is falling behind schedule. Or maybe you need sign off from someone or you need one of your stakeholders who's giving you a dotted line resource to work on one of your projects or whatnot, and the resource is never really assigned. And you sit back and you say to yourself, man, what am I doing wrong on this project? Did I not do this? Did I not present it correctly? Well, at the end of the day, maybe it has nothing to do with you. Because when someone says they don't have time, they have the same 24 hours a day that you have. When someone says they don't have time, they do have the time, <clears throat> but that is a very polite way of saying is, is that of all of the things that I need to do, I'm not prioritizing you high enough to want to give you any of the time in my day. Believe me, if God forbid you walked into their office and you said, there's a fire, we all need to get out of the building, they would make that a priority and find the time to go out and stand in the parking lot until the fire department came. So back to the quote here specifically, what it's saying is, is that, it, let me say the, the feeling behind it is if someone is blocking your way, maybe you're doing something wrong, but ask yourself the question, <clears throat> what is it about this project or about this task that is making it seem not worthwhile or for some reason against the best benefit of the person you are trying to influence. Because if you can think about it from their perspective, and you're gonna see this as, as we move forward, we're gonna have 10 top tips. One of them just, you know, is gonna be uh, related to uh, thinking about it from their perspective, stakeholder uh, empathy, is that's what this is. Is that if you can understand why they're blocking your day, what is it that they do not like about what it is that you're trying to do? Because if you can understand that, you can present it differently. You can maybe explain to them that the return on investment from their perspective is different than they thought it would have been. 
or maybe you just need to raise it to your management because you're saying, hey, they don't want this automation or this process change in their department. There's nothing that I can do to influence this person and you have to move it vertically up the chain. So remember, always ask yourself the question, what is it about this project that this person doesn't like? I'll give you another quote, it's not in here, but goes along with it, is that people have trouble understanding a concept that reduces their paycheck. My next quote is this, is the art of politics is letting other people have things your way. And yes, by the way, I did see this in a Salada tea label around 1985. Uh, to give you an idea of how long ago this was, is what I did was is that uh, I took that little, you know, the little tea bag top, and I taped it to my CRT, my cathode ray monitor, my old, t you know, my old uh, computer screen, and had it there for years until one day the help desk came, took it away, uh, took away the whole thing, and gave me a flat screen. And then I'm thinking, no, where did my uh, where did my label go? But certainly I had said it enough and seen it enough to remember it. But what does this mean? This ties, and I'm going to tie it back directly into influence. <clears throat> this is what you want to be able to do is have basically make it people's idea. Let them get enthusiastic or motivated about this related to them, giving them the energy, having them wanting to follow your vision. Because then, once they're trying to implement your vision, because it's important to them, what are you doing? You're fac helping to facilitate it and thus letting them have things your way. I'm sorry, that shouldn't have come up. Um, now, with this, there's a key component of this that you should also consider. And what this is, is that there's two types of influence, generically. It's what they call push and what they call pull. Pull is when you're trying to motivate people, when you're using all of those type of techniques of telling them why it's good for them, you know, all of those kind of things. You're trying to motivate them to make your cause their own. That's what this is. This is a type of pull motivation, this slide. Push is, let me say, I don't want to say it's a little more dr draconian, but it could be viewed that way is rather than getting them motivated to do it, you're just telling them, do it. Now, you might say, oh, well, I would never want to do that. There are many times when that's the appropriate thing to do, is that a doctor says to you, I see you're having, uh, you know, an issue with whatever it might be. Well, use my case. It's all right, Eric, you have uh, high cholesterol. I want you to take, you know, this particular cholesterol fighting drug uh, once a day and have eat less red meat. So the doctor is using his level of authority. He's certainly trying to motivate me to do so, but basically he's saying do it. Another example of that, and then I'll move on, is uh, when you, at least within the United States, when you go into restrooms, you'll always, in a restaurant, you'll always see a sign that says that uh, employees are required to wash their hands. They're not trying to motivate you and tell you all the great reasons why you should and giving you studies about health and so on. They're just saying, hey, it's the law, wash your hands. That's an example of push. So what I would say to you is, is whereas, as you're trying to influence your stakeholders, whereas the push might be required at some point, ideally, think of this quote. You want to let them have things your way by trying to motivate them. How do you motivate them? You have to understand each one of your different stakeholders, sell, uh, individual motivations in order to do it. Now, what I've done is I've talked about stakeholders a fair amount now. What I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a definition of what a stakeholder is. Now, certainly, I'm probably when I said that, many of you were beginning to roll your eyes like, yeah, I know what a stakeholder is. But I'd like to look at stakeholders from the two perspectives shown here. And obviously, the way that this is worded is it's project-oriented. But quite frankly, it works sort of from any type situation. There are two types of stakeholders. The people who can cause you pleasure or pain during the duration of your project. Now, the people that fall under this first, in, into this first category are those, for example, where you have uh, dotted line resources. That it's, they would be your stakeholders in some case because you have to motivate them to do things. Uh, it would be the, the managers of your dotted line resources that are assigning them to your project. 
<clears throat> it could be the people that you need sign off for on the different stages of what must be performed. Uh, it's the people in the technology group, you know, within uh, different parts of IT that are, um, you know, genning up new regions for you, you know, to be able to load new software or things along that line. It's anyone that you that could cause you personally as say the project manager pleasure or pain related to your project during its duration. The second type of stakeholder is once the project is implemented, all the people that your project causes pleasure or pain onto. So for example, if you're rolling out a new say CRM system, um, is that all of the salespeople who will be required to use that system, say for example, you're rolling out salesforce.com, you did have an internal CRM system and you're moving to a cloud-based CRM, uh, is that all of the salespeople, you were causing them pleasure or pain, sort of from their perspective, whether they like or don't like the new implementation. Both sides of this needs to be considered as we go through all of these next, next sets of slides. In fact, picking on CRM systems for a moment, in the early days of CRM is great software would be implemented, but the salespeople hated it. And as a result of that, what would happen is, is no one would use it. So if you think of it, you know, most, most technology projects are what, they, what I like to call the field of dreams mentality. You know, build it and they will come. But in that case, the salespeople didn't like it. They weren't familiar with automation. Any good salesperson had their own way of knowing who their people were and how to follow up. So what you would have is great implementation, but no adoption. That's an example of how the number two definition here can destroy the credibility and the implementation of your project. Now, um, now with stakeholders in hand, what I'd like to do next is I'd like to move to some general concepts related to um, uh, one more concept related to your level of influence with people. Now, where this comes from, this is actually uh, there's a couple of other things that I'll be doing that are referencing others. This is actually our implementation. This is our our work. But it's it's what's your influence power rating? Now, feel free to take a snapshot of this slide if you'd like, and because it would be worth you digging into it. This, in fact, could be a full webinar on its own. But bottom line is, is how influential you are is based on two, character, two basic characteristics, one of which is the numbers on the left. This adds up to anywhere between zero and 100 points. But those five categories shown on the left, what are your personal attributes, your stature, your interpersonal communications, your business skills, things like negotiation, Influence, conflict resolution, strategic thinking, et cetera, and also your resources. You know, if you have a billion dollars in the bank or you're the one who is the, uh, uh, the CFO, for example, in the firm that's signing the check that allows you to buy the software you need for the project, all of those are attributes about you. On the right-hand side is all influence is situational. So what do you, so in your particular situation, what knowledge do you have on that particular topic? And how open is the audience you're speaking to related to that topic? I'm going to give you an example. My, my poster child example of this is a brain surgeon. Now, brain surgeon, obviously, if you look at the stuff on the left, is that, the, you know, high reputation. Well, they're a brain surgeon, so that's the stature. Let's say they have high interpersonal and business skills just for the sake of argument. And the resources, they have resources to the knowledge, to the hospital, to everything that's needed <clears throat> to perform brain surgery. And let's say that that, that that doctor is talking to a person who is going to be one of her patients. Well, now let's move to the right side of the equation. In the discussion about brain surgery with that patient, what is the doctor's situational knowledge? Extremely high. What is the, audience, the situational audience? Sitting on every word. So as a result of that, in that conversation, the brain surgeon's influence is extremely high. Now let's take that same brain surgeon 
And now what he's doing, he's hanging around on a Sunday afternoon talking to, uh, talking to his friends about who's the best quarterback in the NFL. And this doctor knows zero about football. Absolutely nothing about it. Hanging with his friends who watch it every Sunday. This doctor comes along on Sundays just to be with his friends, is more interested in the ads than the game itself. So in that conversation, now again, Steph on the left, the brain surgeon is the brain surgeon. The brain surgeon's brilliant. But on the right, what's his situational knowledge of the different quarterbacks in football? Zero. And are his friends going to listen to him knowing that he knows nothing about football? No. So as brilliant as that, as that doctor is, in a conversation about best quarterback, that particular doctor, because the situation changes, has zero influence. Now, should the conversation change to the nature of concussions that happen in football and the change in regulations related to concussions, then all of a sudden it, that, that doctor would be more, influential, more um, influential with his football watching buddies. Now, the reason that this is important to you is because there's two things that you can take from this, one of which is, is on the left. What things can you personally do related to your job that will allow you to increase your general stature? Like, for example, I picked on project managers. I'll continue to. If you're a project manager, what you may want to do is uh, if you have your, I think it's uh, 4,000 hours or something like that, sit for the PMP exam. Why? Because that adds to your stature as a project manager. Um, on the resources piece, what you can do there is get the budget approved so that now you're basically in charge of the dollars, the, 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 uh, the equipment, you have the information, you have the contacts, because that raises your stature related to your project's implementation. Interpersonal skills and business skills, those are certainly classes. You'll be learning, you're learning some of that today, actually, as part of today's webinar. So then what things can you do to enhance your credentials and so on to be more, influent, more influent, influential in general? And then on the right, what it does, you can look at this from two perspectives. All of us in business are put in situations where it's, you know, hey, Mary, you make the presentation on Tuesday. And then what you can do in that case is assess, what Mary can do is assess what's her knowledge of the specific topic that's going to be on Tuesday and who are the players in the room. If the players in the room are people who are, are really interested in learning more about what she's saying and the relationship of how much Mary knows related to the topic is greater or less than the people she'll be presenting to, then that changes the level of influence that, uh, that, that she can have in that meeting. The other way you can use this is pick your battles is that if you can assess ahead of time and say, all right, I can do one of these three things. If I implement the project this way, that way, or that way, then where am I the most, where can I be the most influential from a situational perspective? Or maybe there'll be times when whether you'll talk to a specific, rather than have you talk to a specific stakeholder, you'll have your boss talk to that specific stakeholder. Why? Because the nature and the dynamics of the relationship, the organizational level, the amount of knowledge, past experience, maybe your boss worked in the finance group before coming into IT. And this is a discussion with the CFO on why this new budgeting module should replace the old budgeting module. So having, let's say that your boss was previously head of, of uh, budgeting at the firm reporting to the CFO, then that person would have much higher situational, uh, much higher situational um, influence than you would. From here now, with these concepts in place, now I'm going to change the direction on you a little bit. What I want to talk about here is the four roles that IT plays in the company. And you'll see why. Just bear with me on these four, and you'll see very shortly why this is a very, very important thing to consider. IT is basically a utility. Now, what I mean by saying that it's a utility, a utility provider, is people come in in the morning, they expect the systems to be up. They expect email to be working, the internet to have connection, whatever transactional applications they're using is there. Uh, if they click on the button to uh, bring up PowerPoint, they expect that PowerPoint is going to load. 
IT over the years has done such a good job on stability of platform that we're looked at like the electric company. I'd like to ask everybody a question. How many of you this morning when your alarm clock went off so that you could um, get out of bed, get into work on time, so you could listen to my words of written wisdom during today's webinar? Okay, when that alarm clock went off, did you run down the hall, pick up the telephone, call the electric company and thank them for having the power on all night so that uh, you'd be able to get up on time because your alarm clock went off? No, nobody's done that their whole life. So now let me bring it into IT. Corporate executive comes in at six o'clock on a Wednesday morning uh, because they have emails to send, they have to do some research on Google, and they have a few other things to enter into an internal system. Maybe they're doing an expense report from when they were out of town the day before. When they log in and they send a few emails, do they immediately call the help desk and thank them for having email up during the day? Or that early in the morning, rather? No. So when are the times you talk to the electric company? When the power's out or your bill is too high? So when does that executive call IT? when the cross charge is too high or email isn't working. So that's the nature of the first one. <clears throat> Level two, on-demand services. That's help desk. Someone calls up, says I need a new printer cartridge. Someone on the other end of the phone says, great, I'll send up Joe. Joe goes up there, changes the cartridge. Maybe fixes a couple of other things on the PC if required. Level three is general contractor. That's project management. Just like you would hire a general contractor to put a garage on your home, the head of, uh, say, marketing would call IT and ask them to add in a new module related to email aggregation. And the fourth of which is strategic planning, where IT truly has a seat at the business table, the business thinking table, the digital transformation table, if you're familiar with the word. Now, what's interesting about these four is that if you don't do number one and number two right, namely, if you can't keep email up and handle your help desk, then they're not gonna ask you to do project management. They're gonna outsource it. They're just gonna go without rather than have the pain of working with you. And if you go to them and say, well, I really think, um, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Head of Sales, uh, you could really use a new CRM system. What they're gonna do is they're gonna look at you and they say, you know what we really need? We need you to keep email up so that we can correspond with our potential customers. And then number four, the only way that you're going to be considered a strategic partner with your business counterparts is if you do the top three flawlessly. So if you're, if you're not getting the respect internally, there may be other reasons for this related to it. But take a quick check inside and say, what do they think of you? Do they think that you're working well as a level of one, two, and three? And if the answers are yes to that, then there are other things you can do maybe to expand your ability to influence them. But this is a key concept. Remember, if you don't do one and two right, you'll never get the project work. If you, don't, if you can't do one, two, and the project work right, which was number three, they'll never make you a strategic partner. And in fact, if you hear internal rumblings about outsourcing IT um, or outsourcing the help desk or things along that line, um, that should be, as they say, the canary in the coal mine. Um, that is saying to you that they're unhappy with your service. <clears throat> now, number two is proactive versus reactive. I'm going to use a help desk example here. And uh, this will actually tie a little bit to thought leadership, which actually will be number four. But um, let's say that I'm on the help desk and uh, Kara is one of my clients. So Kara calls me up and says, hey, Eric, will you come up and change my printer cartridge? And let's say I know a little bit about Kara's job. Let's say on Monday morning when she comes in is that her job is to print off 20 or 30 reports and give them out to, say, the senior players within the office. I know that it could be done online and things like that, but just hand me through the example. So Monday morning is a very, say, stressful time for her. Now, I want to understand my client. Even I have empathy for Kara. So I see that it's Monday morning. Her printer cartridge is, uh, is down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get up there as fast as I can to replace it. Say our, our SLA, our service level agreement, is 30 minutes. I'm up there in 15. I change her cartridge. She's on our way. Pretty good client service. What do you think? 
you know, I understood my client. I was able to fix the problem. I was up there in half the time of the, uh, of the contract at SLA. Pretty good. However, it's reactive, not proactive. Now, let's say that I said to Carol when I was up there, hey, Carol, you've watched me change this printer cartridge maybe a dozen times. If you want to call me, I'm more than happy to come up and change it for you. But how about I go to inventory, I get an extra printer cartridge, and I leave it here with you because I know how important Monday mornings are to you, the pressure on you to get these reports out. So if your cartridge goes out on a Monday morning, quickly change it yourself, call me, and I'll replace the cartridge. Now, in that case, I'm being proactive. I've shown some initiative. I've come up with a, a potential business solution that could make Kara's day a little less stressful. So then the question is, is that next time Kara has a technical issue or a technical question, might she call me and say, hey, Eric, you had a great idea on that printer cartridge. I'm having this type of issue. What do you think? As soon as that, what do you think, is asked, or Kara thinks to ask that, then it's moving me and IT from strictly just customer service, which is reactive, to relationship management, which is proactive. And if I'm being pro, if I'm proactive with my client, and my client is now calling me and asking me questions, then that's setting me up to what? Enhance my influence with that, uh, in this case with Kara, because she now believes and trusts that I may have good answers that she may not accept, but at least she would consider. So what I would ask you here, number two, is are you being only reactive or are you being proactive to your stakeholders? Number three, <clears throat> reciprocity. Uh, this time what I'm going to do is, if I may, uh, I'm going to pick on um, Mayan, who was the, uh, the person who uh, opened up the webinar for us. Let's say that uh, her and family, let's say that we're neighbors, that her and family have a great 4th of July party every year. You know, we live down the street. We, you know, wave to her when she's walking, her, her husband or walking her dog, et cetera. Um, but you know what? When it comes time for her 4th of July party, they never invite us. It's not that they don't like us. We're just sort of not part of their general circle of friends. But we really, really want to get invited to their 4th of July party. So what do we do? We have a, let's say that we have a great holiday party that we do in the December time frame. So what we do is we invite Mayan and her, and, and her family to join us for our holiday party. Now, whether they attend or don't attend, they know they were asked. And because they were asked, when they're putting together their uh, invite list for the 4th of July, they're going to say, well, you know, the Blooms did invite us to their holiday party. You know, we couldn't go, but, uh, but it was really nice of them to invite us. You know what? This year, why don't we invite them to our 4th of July party? So do you see how here I've used the concept of reciprocity to influence Mayan to do something on my behalf. So what I would say to you is use it proactively. Use what's called strategic reciprocity with your stakeholders. What that is, is first you have to be developing a list of stakeholders that you may need a favor from during the, uh, during the time that you're, pro that you're working on your project, during the project's duration. And then what you want to do is that you want to basically put money in the reciprocity bank so that if they feel like they owe you a favor, then, they will, uh, then it will be easier for you to influence them to do what you need to get done. So I'm going to give you a specific example of that. I don't mean invite them to parties. I don't mean bring them lunch. Um, I mean, do you know those emails that you get? I, I know I get my email addresses everywhere. So as a result of that is, is that I get probably 15 of these a day, maybe more. But what they are, are they're well-written white papers and things on particular topics. So let's say, for example, that one of the groups that I'm trying to influence is the, the, the group internally that handles computer security. And I just happen to get this great white paper distributed as a marketing piece. You know, I'm not giving away any sort of intellectual property that's, um, you know, that's confidential, but I get a marketing um, white paper from, say, Rapid7, you know, who's a, a nationally known security firm. 
I get it. It's not really interesting to me because I'm not really a security guy. I might look it over quickly. Just maybe there's something that I could gleam off of, off of it that would be of interest. But what I do is I say, wow, look at this. Kelly is the person in security that I'm trying to uh, gain favor with because I'm going to need her sign off on my project or at least get uh, maybe not for the sign off, but I'm going to need the prior the prioritization of her team to look at my project uh, before it can be signed off on. Let me sign, say it that way because I don't want to make it sound like you, I'll do something for you, you do something for me. All right. So I just want to get the prioritization in. So then, what do I do? Is I take this white paper. How long did it take me to research this white paper and find it? Nothing. I got it in my email. So I looked at it and went, "Huh, not for me." Hey, I bet Kelly can use this. So I forward it with a with a 30 second email that says, hey, Kelly, saw this thought of you. I don't know if you're on their list, but or if this will be a value to you, but just thought I'd pass it your way. Boom. You don't talk anything about your project or whatnot. You do that a couple of times. Kelly's going to get these and say, wow, you know what? Eric just forwarded to it. Maybe if I'm lucky, it's a piece of information that's of great value to her. That's how you can strategically use reciprocity to prime the pump, to influence people later as needed. Number four, thought leadership. You know, um, I'll speak for about myself for a moment as I went to school to be actually an accountant and a computer programmer. You know, I started as a programmer, was a business analyst, a PM, et cetera, you saw my resume. But when I went to school, what I was told was, is the way to move ahead from a tech to move ahead professionally is to become a subject matter expert in the area that was my primary expertise, which was computer program. And then what I was told is that once I could truly be a you know an SME in programming and whatever language or technologies I was using, is to expand it to technologies related to my core technology. So I was a programmer, so then what did I expand it to? I expanded it to relational databases. Why? Because most programs that you write, one way or another, affect data. So I actually was an Oracle DBA for, uh, for a couple of years along the way, too, just as part of my responsibility. But anyway, the reason I say that is what moves you from being a subject matter expert to being a thought leader is when you're, say, an inch wide, you know, whatever security, whatever your thing, whatever your specialty is, is if you're an inch wide and a mile deep, you're an SME. If you start gaining horizontal knowledge, well, maybe you're more than an inch deep, but you're a mile wide. What I say to people is this, I sell, you know, and I go back and forth. I'm not any company that I mention, whether it be Microsoft or Oracle or SAP, you know, there's nothing, I have no hidden agenda there. It just sounds better than company X, company Y. But let's say, for example, that your company is using the Oracle financials. That what I one thing I would say to you is I said, have you ever been to an SAP conference for where they use you know where they talk they use a group that where their SAP talks about you know their financial systems, and people would laugh at me and they'd say, well, why would I ever want to go to an SAP user conference? I'm an Oracle con I'm an Oracle user, and I'd say the reason is is because basically is is it's the, it's a major piece of software competing against yours in the same application space. Maybe SAP is doing some particular set of modules or analysis that Oracle doesn't have, that if you understood the concepts of how they did it, you could suggest customizing a module in your shop. When this horizontal knowledge moves you from being an, simply an SME to also being a thought leader, the one other thing you need to be in order to be a thought leader is you have to be willing to share your knowledge, experience, and insights. You know, in the old days, you know, what, what did they say? You know, information was power. There's no fact that you could ask me or anybody else that's of general knowledge that we couldn't find within 30 seconds in a Google search or a Bing search, you know, being fair. So, uh, so it's the aggregation, it's the insights gained from that data. When you're willing to share it, people will come to you for advice. When people come to you for advice and believe that you're very knowledgeable in that area, if I go back to here, what does it do? On the right-hand side of it, it, that you've now widened your knowledge, it increases your situational knowledge, but what it also does is the audience will be more willing to listen to you because they believe you have this widened, this widened, ability, widened ability. All right, let's move on. Benefits, not features. 
the big thing to think about here is that we as experts, so let's say, for example, you're, you know, you're working on the accounting system, the CRM system, you're uh, rolling out a cloud that you're moving from Microsoft Exchange to, cloud, to uh, Outlook 365, whatever it may be. If you were the expert in that topic, you can hear about features. Well, this has features A, B, and C. And what you can do as the expert is you can extrapolate from the features to the benefits of those features. People who are not as familiar or don't have the technical capability or insights that you do to the topic, they just hear features. Therefore, what you want to do when you speak to your stakeholders is don't talk about them of, oh, yeah, we're implementing report A, B, and C. What you want to do is you want to talk about the benefits of A, B, and C. An example of this is I'm going to pick on CRM again. In fact, this is, uh, this is a story. I use it in my keynotes where uh, I was teach teaching a you know, typical IT management class a number of years ago. And, uh, and I asked everybody, I said, from a vision perspective or you know, what, what is the mission of your department? What does your department do? And it was it happened to be a, the person, the manager in charge of CRM. And what he said was, he says, oh, yeah, you know, we upgrade the CRM system once in a while. You know, we babysit the salespeople if they forget how to use the features in it. And I don't know. We generate some reports and stuff for the, you know, those senior managers on the 10th floor. All right. Doesn't that sound like a department description that would want to get you up on a Monday morning if you're working for this guy and get into work? No. So I said to him, as I said, never, ever explain to people your department in that way. Because what was he talking about? He was talking about the features, software upgrade, uh, instruction on different pieces. I said to him, as I said, well, why does the company have a CRM system? And he looks at me like I'm a dummy. And he says, well, they have it to make the sales force more efficient. And I said, well, why does the company care if the sales force is more efficient? He looks at me again like, well, you know, what are you from Mars? And he says to me, well, because if the salespeople are more efficient, then the company will make more, make more money. And I said, aha. I said, see, so you, what your department's goal is isn't to you know, upgrade a piece of software anywhere, here or there. Your company's goal is Salesforce productivity enhancement with the goal of maximizing company revenue. And he said, yeah, that is it. So I said, always describe it this way, basically the benefits of what you're doing, not the features. Ran across him two years later, just, you know, in a conference, walked by each other, said, ah, I know you. Yeah, I know you. And he told me, came over to me and he said, you know what? I took your advice. He said, I, from that day forward, I described my department as being uh, basically Salesforce productivity enhancement with the goal of maximizing company revenue. And he said, a lot of things happened. Said one person in his department said to him, he says, hey, you know what? Our system is actually helping make the money that's paying our paychecks. Also, the salespeople, the sales management rather, understood what benefit his department was providing because he basically just put it out there in their face. And they then started asking him on, hey, how else can we improve Salesforce productivity? Because now he was in the Salesforce productivity and revenue maximization business. He wasn't in software upgrades and babysitting salespeople. That's the power of this one. He also said, by the way, more of his projects got funding because he started naming his projects based on the business benefit. So it was basically, you know, uh, so, uh, I'm making this part up, but you know, he would have named his project something similar to um, sales productivity enhancement through multidimensional analysis reporting for salespeople, as opposed to CRM 3.2 upgrade. So if you get the idea. Next, stakeholder empathy. If you have not studied emotional intelligence, do so. You know, there's a couple of great books out there, one by Dan Goleman called, well, Emotional Intelligence. There's another one out there by um, Bradbury and somebody, forgive me, I can't remember the other author's name. I think it's Travis, but don't hold me to it. 
called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. You may have seen those books around. It's a white book with like orange letters and lines on it. <clears throat> but anyway, learn about emotional intelligence. What it does, it does some things for you personally. If you can understand yourself, you can manage yourself. But I'm going to move to the right side of it because we're talking about influencing stakeholders. If you can understand others, you know, it ties back to that first quote that I showed you, uh, that I, just, that I uh, shared with you on generally speaking, people aren't against you, they're for themselves. How do you know what they're for? You have empathy for them. You know, the uh, never judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. You know, there's a million expressions related to that. But if you can understand things from their perspective, you can more, more uh, accurately anticipate their needs. You can build software that won't that the, the users won't say to you, gee, you know what? I can't use this software. You built what I asked for, but you didn't build what I wanted or what I needed. They'll gain respect for you because you can understand things from their perspective and also you're speaking their language. When you're talking to your stakeholders, if they're accountants, talk in accounting talk. You know, if they're marketing people, talk in marketing talk. You know, don't start talking about, you know, well, we're going to gem three new technical environments uh, because what you'll see is that if you do that, if, if you're in the habit of doing that, either think back or next time you do it by default, you'll sort of see this blank look come on people's faces that don't understand what you're talking about. That means you're talking features, not benefits, or that what you're doing is you're not talking about something by, uh, from their perspective because you don't have proper empathy and understanding for their point of view. Next, taking the moral high ground. What this one is, is basically it says here, it's hard to disagree with doing the right things for the right reasons. So I'm going to give you an example of where I use this. When I was in a, a CIO role, um, I, I only had enough resources to do two projects. However, I had five groups that I was responsible to do projects for. So if I made the decision of which two projects to do, by definition, three of the five people who have input into my performance review would think I have bad decision-making ability and would be mad, mad at me out of the blocks. Not a good place to be. So what I did was I brought the five of them together, sort of steering committee-ish like. And I said to them, as I said, I'll tell you what, I only have enough resources in my department to do two of the projects. I know with the five of you, there are five projects. I personally, wow, I would love to do all five of these projects for you, but I don't have the resources. So let's the six of us together, the five of them and myself, let's the six of us together sit down and figure out which two projects are best for the company and do, and do those two, pick them as a group. Now, the other three people, they, if their projects weren't, weren't picked, they were, they were mad. They were unhappy. They were disappointed. And if they were mad, they might have been mad their project wasn't selected, but they weren't mad at me. But also what it allowed them to do was then those other three could go back to their departments is we gave them the words. Say, for example, the budgeting system was not approved and the manager of budgeting had to go to the CFO and say, I can't do my goal this year because of implementing a new budget system because you know I can't get IT to do it. That's a very different discussion than we sat down, we, we just had a meeting with IT, I mean, with, with IT and sales and marketing and manufacturing and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And whereas our budget project was important, it was felt that all the money this year from IT, all their resources needed to go into manufacturing because we're having a problem producing product. So what that does is that gives the, the budgeting manager a little bit of uh, wiggle room, so to speak, to get some slack from his boss on maybe we'll roll this goal to next year. Or the CFO could say, you know what, why don't we get Bloom's group more resources? We'll, we'll hire another couple, uh, we'll give them funding to hire another couple of contractors to implement the budget system for us. It's one thing for me to go to my boss and ask for more resources. It's another thing for one of my stakeholders to go to my boss and ask to give me more resources. It's a different animal. So do you see how I'm using influence from, in that case, multiple different perspectives, but in all cases, doing it taking the high road. Gratitude. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you said thank you to someone in a business perspective, in a business situation 
after the problem was solved. I'm going to give you an example. And by the way, as you do this, do it for the right reasons. Do all this stuff for the right reasons. You know, don't do this to try to manipulate people. You know, when I teach influence, people say, oh, you, so you manipulate people. I say, no, I influence them to do the things that's best for them, the company, the project, the world. But I'm going to tell you what happened to me is a few months ago, the ISP that I was working with, our internet service provider, we had a big gnarly product related to uh, outgoing email, spam filters, and oh my God, it was awful. Okay, And our emails weren't getting out to our clients. So we worked with them. It was this miserable process to figure out where in the process the emails were getting, uh, were getting trapped and not sent out. And then it worked. And then what I did was, you know what, you know, once the problem was solved, I sent a, uh, just a, an email into the, the second level support group there. And I said, hey, you know what? I know the problem solved. I know you guys worked really hard on this. I just wanted to drop you an email and say thank you. And I truly meant it. And I did it with no other reason than I, I just wanted to thank them because I really appreciated their hard work to get our systems back up. I got an email back from the manager of that group who I'd never spoken to before, only the people in, in his or her group. And what she said to me was she said, thank you so much. We never get letters like that after the fact. You have another problem at a future point? Call me directly. I'll be happy to help you. Now, I didn't do it for that reason, but that's the advantage of uh, that's the, the advantage that comes to you just by a willingness to say thank you. Just thinking it isn't enough. That 30 second email, you know, if God forbid we get some other big problem two months from now and I forward, I reply to that email uh, that I received, I will get better tech support than if I had never sent that email in the first place. Number nine, organizational awareness. It's imperative, and this, by the way, ties back to emotional intelligence also, so just so you know. But organizational awareness is understanding where the political landmines are, how to navigate the political related issues. You know, every company has uh, somebody, I'll, I'll call her Amy. All right. And you want something done in this company? You ask Amy. Why? Because she seems to sort of know everybody. She knows the processes that you go through to get this from this department or that from that department. She just seems to know the people, know the flow, understand the politics and, you know, is one of those person, people who can just get things done. How does Amy able to do this? Part of it is she understands the organizational awareness. She knows that Mike might be the manager of the department, but if you really want to get the attention and get something done, ask Joe. And she'll know Joe. How will she know Joe? Because Joe might have needed something for another department, knows that Amy is the one who can sort of get things worked through. So Amy helped Joe do whatever it was that Joe needed. So now there's also reciprocity so that when she calls Joe, Joe is glad to give her a hand. That's how these people navigate uh, is by the combination of a lot of the things that we've discussed, but tied into, in this specific case, organizational awareness. And that brings us to number 10. And by the way, these are in no specific order. It's not like, you know, 10 is the best or one was the best. It's just, they're just 10. But what this one is, passion and conviction. You know, Steve Jobs had, and I think this is his most famous quote, or at least it's the one that resonated most with me. And what it is, is leaders lead by example, whether they want to or not. You know, sort of on a parental side, it's the equivalent of when people say, you know, as a parent, you never want to say to your kids, don't do what I do, do what I tell you. <clears throat> it's the same basic philosophy. But if you show passion and conviction on what it is you're trying to do, you know, the initiative that you're driving, man, it is so important to you because you know it's important to the company. You know, you, you just feel this in your bones that you want to get this done. Everybody will feel that. Humans are pack animals. When one person yawns, everyone yawns. When one person coughs or clears their throat, other people will do the same. We're pack animals by, you know, our nature. So if you have this high level of passion and conviction for what you're trying to do, other people will want a piece of that. They'll feel it in you. 
That's why when people start their own companies, they say start it in something that you're passionate about. First of all, because you're going to be doing it 10, 12 hours a day. But the other thing is, is, is that because if people feel that passion, it will be easier for you to influence them to gain the resources, follow along, you know, whatever it is that you need them to do. So what I would say to you, whatever project you're on now, you know, in, don't, you know if you're saying to yourself, oh yeah, it was a project 10, yeah, project 10, all right, gotta get it done. Hey, stakeholder, yeah, I'm working on project 10, we gotta push it ahead. What I would say to you is find a way to have passion for that project. A Little bit of it might be, you know, a little mental gymnastics, talking yourself into it. Because think about it, when people come to you, if they are totally unpassionate about what they're doing, does that make you want to help them, support them, follow their cause? You know, they're not interested in what they're doing. Why should you be interested in what they're doing? So this is the way to look at this. Now, from all this that we've talked about, about, you know, influence from different perspectives and emotional intelligence and all this other stuff, all of that raises one important question which probably you've already figured the answer to if you've made it to minute 56 of this one hour webinar. And the question is, why study non-technical non topics like writing, active listening, influence, negotiation, and other soft skills? I've been doing this stuff my whole life. Well, you know what? Like, I'll give you an example of that. When I was a three-year-old kid and I wanted a cookie, what did I say to my mother? Mom, I want a cookie. And then my mother would say no. I'm actually going to have to tell her that I used this story today. And then my mother would say no. And then I'd say, Mom, I want a cookie. And then my mother would say no, it's almost dinner time. I'd go, Mom, I want a cookie. And then I've sort of figured out from experience that if I want a fourth time and say, Mom, I want a cookie, that she'll say, fine, I'll give you a cookie. I didn't think to myself as a three-year-old, gee, you know what? I would really like a cookie. I think I'm going to use the technique of repeated request to see if I can get my mother to give me a cookie prior to dinner. No, I just did it by gut feel and learned it. So then if I'm doing this stuff by gut feel my whole life, then why do I want to study it? The answer is, is rather than using gut feel, if you learn and use defined interpersonal communication processes and techniques, then you can improve your ability at these processes and techniques through algorithmic enhancement. The same way that if you're a programmer, you become a better programmer through experience because you know to do a do while instead of a while do. Or uh, if you're in agile world, you know, you used to do a break, uh, a burn down chart this way. But if you make this tweak to it, it resonates more with your stakeholders. The same thing is true is if you dig in deeper to the techniques and other techniques that we didn't talk about today that are soft skill oriented, what you'll find is they'll drive your ability to be better at it. From here, what I'd like to do is I'd like to say thank you for hanging with us for the hour. Um, I'd like to turn it back to, I think, Kelly. Uh, ask if there's any questions. I'm glad to stay on a little bit longer. But uh, Kelly, I'd like to turn it back to you if I could, please. Yes, thank you so much, Eric. We always enjoy having you with us. If you guys have any questions, feel free to type those into the uh, questions menu option now, and we will go ahead and have Eric address those over audio. Also want to let you guys know that you will receive a copy of um, a PDF of the PowerPoint slide presentation, along with a link to view the session recording, so you may go back and view anything you may have missed or want to review. You can also pass it on to any friends or colleagues that you wish anyone can view this webinar. Um, I also want to point you guys to our website at newhorizons.com. There you will find our, um, if you click on the Center for Leadership and Development, you will find all of our upcoming courses that we have to offer you on various topics such as the one that you viewed today. So please go ahead and view our uh, website and there you can also register for any upcoming webinars or view past webinars in our webinar archive and those are all free for you to view at any time. So let's see if there's any questions, Eric. We've gotten a lot of thank yous and um, a lot of great presentations. So let me just go through these real quick. All right, it looks like we don't have any questions. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up today's session. Eric, thank you again so much for joining us and presenting on behalf of New Horizons. Thank you to you and Mayan for engineering and for all those listening. It's truly appreciated. I hope it was of value. 
All right, great. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you'll join us for future webinars and take a look at all of our available course offerings. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.